we are very conscious of prayers for us, and uh, Gordon is certainly conscious of prayers. Sue, it's lovely to see you, but even better to see you sitting down. <laughs> okay. No, that's fine. It's always me. But before we start off, this is the second week of Advent, and uh, it's it's a particularly good week to to have in the present uh, climate because it's all about peace, and we surely need peace. So I'm going to light the candle here, have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to hand over to a very capable brother, Gordon. Oh, that's a very long one, isn't it? <laughs> Don't break it. Don't break it. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. Lord, I thank you first that you have given the peace of God that passes all understanding to some. And I know my sister who is dying from cancer has this peace, and we thank you for that. But Lord, we we pray and plead with you for peace in Gaza and peace in Ukraine. Lord, come down in all your power and give us peace in this world. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Nice to see some new faces. It's always good to see new faces. Always good to see old faces as well. Well, <laughs> it's, it's not always good to see old faces, you know. I can remember uh, 1967. It was. It was my first wedding anniversary. Not to Sue, I have to say. Um, uh, some of you remember my first wife, but uh, um, and we went out on our wedding anniversary for that, for a meal in a lovely restaurant not far from Crawley where we lived, and uh, we had a, a lovely meal, nice bottle of wine. The whole thing was very very good. And at the end of the meal, I paid the bills and everything else like this. And I thought, well, I'd give the waiter a tip. And then I suddenly remember that it, it was one of those uh, restaurants that had a wine waiter. And so I thought I'd give him a, a, a tip as well. And I put my hand in my pocket and had a look to see how much money I had. And I had five and tuppence. <laughs> now, for the vast majority of you, that won't mean anything, but it was two half crowns and two pennies. So the older folk will know that a half crown and a penny are roughly the same size. Two of them are silver, the half crowns, and the pennies are bronze. Uh, and a half crown was worth... 12 and a half P, which might sound not a lot of money, but in 1967, that was a reason you could go out and buy something with that. And I thought, at a lovely meal, I'll give him the two half crowns as we go out. Uh, and as we went out, I said, thank you very much. That was very nice. And got home. Uh, and you know what you do? You go to bed and you empty your pockets out and put my money on there, and I've got two half crowns. I'd give him tuppence <laughs> as a tip. Do you know we didn't go back to that? We didn't go back to that restaurant for over twenty years. Uh, you weren't the um, you weren't the wine waiter, were you, David? No. I was a very tired guy. But it is. It's always good to see new people as well. Um, and as uh, Peter's already said, we're into the second Sunday of Advent, so two candles are lit, talking about peace. Um, and you just prayed a little bit about the Gaza. I, I don't know. I never know what to pray. No. What, how, how do you sort of say, Lord, you know, come down and just, I don't know. But we just need peace to be out there, don't we? We need it in Ukraine. Do you know how many days of peace we've had in this world since the end of the Second World War? One day. No, 18, actually. <laughs> yeah, 18 days of peace. I mean, it's just, it's mind-boggling, isn't it? That's the whole of my life. I was literally born just at the end of the war. Well, after the, the, the war had finished when I was born, but only just. So for the whole of my life, uh, basically, there's most probably been 18 days of peace. I'm going to read some words from John. John, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that had been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. 
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We're going to sing a, a lovely Christmas Advent hymn, really. It says, Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. Hail in the time appointed, his reign on earth begun. If you're going to stand, stand. If you want to sit, sit. <coughs> before the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come here today to worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we have voices to sing your praise. 
But Lord, it's not only coming from our mouths, but we pray that these uh, signs of worship are coming from our heart. Lord, that we believe what we're singing. Lord, that we're giving you the glory. We're saying, hail to the Lord's anointed. And Father, that's what we come to recognise. You know, we're almost at that time when we come uh, to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. But Lord, we don't just come once a year. We come week by week. We come to give you thanks and praise. We pray, Heavenly Father, that this time of year the message of your Son coming to save sinners will resonate with people who want to know more. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that for each of us we will be given the opportunities just to share your love. So, Lord, we thank you for this place. We thank you for the members. We pray for any who are not with us today for whatever reason. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you just put your arms around them and bless them. But for us, Lord, we pray that you'd open our hearts and our minds, that you would give us ears to hear. We pray, Heavenly Father, that before we leave here today, we know that we've met with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that as we've come, we've seen that the table is laid for a meal that will satisfy all those who believe. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we can take seriously today that time as we gather around your table to eat and drink together. So be with us, Heavenly Father, we ask now, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 going to do things a little bit different today. Um, um, Peter knows, I think you've got to know me now. I forget how long I've been coming here, 10 years possibly, I don't remember. Um, and I, Peter said to me, do you want the communion at the end of the service? And I said, well, it doesn't really seem right. Because if you read John's Gospel, John 13 is where communion starts. Jesus breaks bread with his brothers and sisters. And having done that, he then teaches them. And if you read the next 14, 15, 16, 17, the next four chapters, it's, you know, Jesus is teaching his people and he ends up by turning around and saying, the greatest commandment I give to you is love one another. That's what we're called to do, isn't it? Not always easy. <laughs> Not always like one another. Doesn't tell us to like one another, but we're told to love one another. Uh, and sometimes that's... Um, that's easy. It's easier to love someone another than always to like one another. But um, that's what we're called to do. So we're going to do that after we've sung another hymn. Um, we're going to then sort of go through, uh, and, and that will be pretty well the rest of the service. But we should be away by two. <laughs> um, so we're going to sing... Uh, tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord, outnumbered blessings, give my soul a spirit voice. Let's stand and sing. I'm going to come this way. <laughs>
place in front of the throne do I really love in the service? When we come to this meal. When, when we came here, I forget how many weeks ago, Roger and uh, Janice invited us out for, uh, for dinner, didn't we? We had a lovely meal there, but I'm sorry, this one puts yours to shame. <laughs> I said, this one puts yours to shame. I'm not saying, look, we love the meal, and I'm not sort of joking, but this is the meaning in this meal. It is so much more important. You know, when Jesus gathered his, his, his disciples 2,000 years ago, we've no idea how many times that they gathered around the Passover table. Only one time is listed, but we would imagine that the previous two years they would have gathered, and so the disciples would have said, you know, but we're going to pass over this year. And Jesus sent to them off and said, that's where we're going to do it. And it got there, didn't it? And they sat down. And we have this lovely picture, uh, and you can see it in big pictures where you've got just the 12 disciples and Jesus sitting around. Actually, it doesn't say that in the Bible. Um, I would imagine Mary Magdalene would have been there, and some of the other women, and maybe one or two other people as well. It was a feast. You know, I have no idea what you, you said to me. Uh, can you can you have me for Christmas dinner or something? Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Now we've all got our own things that we do at Christmas. Yeah, whether it be with family, we have traditions, um, and that would have been the same when Jesus gathered with his disciples around the Lord's, you know, around that table. Like that. It, this, it, they weren't just these two bits there. There would have been lamb. There would have been salt. There would have been water. There would have been several cups of wine, seven cups of wine, actually, uh, and lots of other bits. Uh, and as you went through the meal, the youngest member of whoever was there would have to ask a question, why are we here? And it would have been up to the, to the person who was leading, which would, I mean, presume it would have been Jesus, would have told myself, but you know, a few thousand years ago, um, we, the Israelites, were in captivity in Egypt. And you can read all about it in the book of Exodus, how Moses, with God's help, brought them out. And so we've come to remember that at one point in that story, God sends his Passover angel to go out throughout the... And that's where the name the Passover comes from. And so they come to celebrate that point. You know, they've got salt on the table. It's the salt water of the river... Uh, the Red Sea. Anyone been to the Red Sea? I've been to the Red Sea. I've never been diving in it, but I know people who dive in it. So when you look at that story of Moses coming through the Red Sea, you know, it's not just a little brook where they might get their feet wet. It's a sea. The Lord parted the sea for a million people hmm. and everything else that they were carrying to go through on dry ground. Now I don't know nowadays if you have the ability to part the Red Sea, how long it would take for that bit of mud in the middle there to dry out, but we're told that the ground was dry. And the whole of the Passover supper is celebrating that, the different pizza on them. You know, they had to the cut, they had to sacrifice a lamb and put the blood over the both doorposts. That's why you had the lamb. And then there were these elements. Yeah, there were wine just for drinking. They all had sort of a special significance. The seventh cup was never touched. Even in the Jewish um, Passover meal now, they never touched the seventh cup. Why? Anyone know why? It's the Messiah's cup. For them, they don't believe that the Messiah has come. Isn't that sad? It's tragic. And that's what I really, you know, feel very sad for, for Israel. Bread. Just there, part of the meal. But for us, that Jesus turned it all on his head. I'm going to read the words from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says this, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. So the choice is yours. If you recognise the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Saviour, you're welcome to take part in this meal. If you're uncertain, you're not sure, don't be afraid to let it go by. You know, we can pray together. If you want to really know what we as believers, why we take this, you know, come and talk to one of us after. You know, because what we want is you to have the same relationship with Jesus as we've got. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity here on this second Sunday of Advent to, to gather around this table, this feast that you provide for us. Lord, we thank you for the bread which just signifies your body your body that was broken on that cross at Calvary. But Lord, as we eat it, we are saying, we believe in you, Jesus. We believe that you died for us. And as we take the cup, just wine or fruit juice or whatever it may be, but Heavenly Father, it signifies your Son's blood was shed on that cross at Calvary. It's the cup of the new covenant. And by drinking that again, we're proclaiming that we are fellow believers in our Lord and, Je Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. So forgive us for all those things that we've done. Cleanse our hearts and our minds by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may worthily magnify your holy name. Amen. 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 I'd love someone, I don't mind who it is, would someone like to come and distribute the bread for me? <coughs> Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for this bread. Mm just signifies your body. It is just bread, but Lord, it has a real significance far more powerful than that. So bless the bread and bless those that are going with it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody else like to come and hold, take the cup round for me. I'm going to ask that we hold the cup. <coughs> <coughs> 
that we can drink together. Of the Lamb shed for the forgiveness of sin. Let's drink with grateful hearts. Mm. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with your body and cleansing us with your blood. Lord, just bless each one of us now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> One of the other things I feel is always right as you go around the Lord's table is we have prayer for intercession. Uh, and there's going to be a time of prayer now. I'm going to pray. I don't know if you want to pray for Israel or whatever. Uh, I'm going to pray for Roger. Is it tomorrow you're going? Or the end of the week. End of the week. Mm -hmm. I'll pray for Roger. He's going to go in for an operation and just pray for, for healing. And we thank God for Peter's operation. I thank God for bringing Sue with me today. Mm -hmm. um, she needs to know the prayer of um, peace. Mm -hmm. Maybe a good one, Peter. Peace and uh, just being able to sit still and, and not rush around as she's got to recover. And I know that she would want me to say, she really said, it, but thank you to all those who signed the card. That really blessed her heart when it came this way. Let's pray. Yeah, we thank you, dear Lord, that Peter Cottenham is feeling very well today. But we love him very much because he he is a, a person who with to whom we can listen to. I also pray, dear Lord, for those in Gaza. I pray it's so very difficult to know what to pray. But I do think it was wrong that they should continue with the war. Dear Heavenly Father, and say, may they please realise that we need to have compassion mm. upon the others. Mm. And so we lift them up to you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Yeah. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, just pray for my parents at this difficult time, mm. that they will seek the help they need uh, during this time and things will come good for them. Amen. 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 We pray, dear Lord, for the events that are coming up in yeah. the church. Mm. Pray for Messi tomorrow and yeah. we pray, dear Lord, for those that are coming to check us tomorrow that we're doing everything right, mm. finds it um, good. And we do pray for those that are coming. We pray for those at the youth club as well, dear Lord, that's mm -hmm. taking part. And also other events that are coming up, the carol services and the carol candlelight service. We do pray that people will come, dear Lord. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Dear Lord, we do pray for healing power with Pete, mm. and uh, not well. We pray that you would heal him and give him, uh, give him peace, 
and may he feel much better soon. It's been a long time. Well, I again thank you for the peace that my sister has. She knows that she is dying and she knows it won't be long. But she's at such peace with you, Lord. Pray that you give that peace to her family as well, to her husband and her three children. And they may be encouraged by her faith. Two of them know you, Lord. One, we're not sure. But Lord, we do pray for each of them that they may come to know you as their Lord and Saviour. And that they may be encouraged by their sister. By our sister, sorry, my sister and our sister. Lord, we thank you that we can pray for anyone because we are one big family. I thank you for the family here at Cheney and all the prayers that offered for myself. And I thank you for answered prayer. Do pray for Sue as well, that you help her to be able to rest. I know it's difficult, Lord. God knows I know it's difficult to rest and not do anything. But Lord, I pray that you would help her to do that. Be with God and as he cares for her as well. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <coughs> Heavenly Father, we pray for our friend and Christian Sue. And your servant Paul Daniel, yeah. who is in hospital in Eastbourne, having had a major stroke, no. not able to communicate with his friends, not with his family, not really knowing what's going on, probably. And we don't know what's going on in his head. That head that is full of your word. And just pray, Lord, that by your spirit, you might feed him scraps of your word to sustain him at this time. We pray you would bring him um, out of the state that he's in, that it might be possible for his family to talk to him. We pray for his wife Lynn and his daughter Vicky and husband Jason who ministering to him and caring for one another at this time. We pray you give him the strength they need and we pray, Lord, that you will answer their prayer. We thank you for his ministry for so many years, yeah. so many church families. And, uh, Lord, we just pray that uh, he, will, he will know your love deep inside him. And that he will come back. Amen. 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 We want to pray for Roger as he goes in for surgery this week. Lord, be with the nurses and the doctors. Lord, that your hands would be their hand. They would accept your guidance. And Lord, that soon Roger will be hung and fit. And be prepared to, to be still for a little bit. Uh, and to recover and to get back to full health. Lord, be with us. Lord, we know that there are wars going on in the Ukraine. We know of everything that's going on in the Middle East. And Father, we can just shake our heads and say, why? Why do brothers and sisters hate one another? Mm -hmm. Lord, we just pray that your love can just pervade this world, especially maybe at this time. <coughs> yes. Lord, that we can really know, as Peter has said today, today is a day of peace, that people can know your peace, the peace that passes all understanding. Be with us now, we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <coughs> Amen. up here and says what's next oh yes I'm going to read from uh, God's word from Luke chapter 1 uh, verses 26 uh, to 45 we're in the second uh, Sunday of Advent so it just seemed right that we sort of look at, uh, at the sort of the grounding of it really verses 26 which says and you're going to hear this uh, again over the next few days I'm, I'm not sure I'm not uh, I don't doubt verse 26 in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a town in Galilee 
to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me will be fulfilled. And the angel left her. And at that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who, will, who has believed that the Lord would fulfil his promises to her. Do you know, it's a lovely song. I'm going to sing it to you. It's called Mary's Boy Chant. No, it's not. It's called Mary, Did You Know? Sorry. <laughs> Mary, did you know that your baby boy would someday walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save your sons and daughters? your baby boy has come to make you new this child that you delivered will once deliver you Mary did you know that your baby boy will give sight to the blind man Mary did you Would calm the storms with his hand. Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels draw? When you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will.
Do you know, I think it's a lovely, lovely little song, isn't it? Can you imagine Mary sitting there, just holding the baby? And have you had, he had babies? A few of you, I guess, most probably. Do you remember what it was like when you first held it? Yeah? Do you remember what it was like when you first held it? Yeah? Do you remember what it was like when you first held it? Do you remember what it was like when you first held it? Yeah? It's lovely, isn't it? I can remember holding my first child, you know, my first son, and sort of thinking, I wonder what the future holds for you. You know, I'm talking 57 years ago he was born, a few days ago, a week ago. Yeah, it was a week ago, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I can remember holding him and thinking, what have I brought him into? We're in, in a world where Everything seemed to be going wrong. The, you know, the Russians and everything else was going on like that. There was a cold war, um, and, and you just didn't know what was going on. Well, why have I done this? And here we are, 57 years later, still sort of asking those same questions. Two weeks' time, it's going to be... Do you know what's going to be in two weeks' time? Do you remember? Uh, Christmas or Christmas Eve, it'll be. Christmas Eve, it'll be. Um, and I guess we should, you know, maybe have been looking at this passage of Scripture which talks about the, uh, when Jesus, or when Mary was told that she was going to have this baby Jesus, we should have been talking that nine months ago, shouldn't we, really? But we never do. We, we always talk about it in, in, in Advent. So maybe the second Sunday in Advent is as good as any. And we had... Uh, uh, at the beginning of this chapter, if we'd started at chapter uh, verse 1, but I thought if we read the whole of the chapter, that's going to take up a good chunk of the thing. But if we'd read the first part, we'd have seen how Elizabeth came to be pregnant. But it was another divine intervention, if you like. Um, Elizabeth was a, a woman of older years. We don't know how old, but we were told that she was past child-bearing age. Um, and there are some people who believe, and uh, this is just a, a thought, and it's a thought maybe that I've got as well, is that uh, when uh, Elizabeth's uh, happened, uh, it was Zachariah, who was a priest in the temple, would have been in Jerusalem. And he would have been given, one of these people who's given an honour of going into the temple <coughs> to light the incense. It only happened twice a year. One of those was at Yom Kippur, which was in March, April time. Uh, and it was a very special honour, and it was drawn out by lots. I can remember some years ago, back in 2001, I was given um, a, a real honour. You know, I couldn't believe it when they asked me if I would be the president of the group of churches which I belonged to. Uh, and it, it was an honour, you know. So for Zachariah, this was an honour uh, to be able to serve the people in this way. And he went in there. Nobody told him what he had to do, I don't suppose. Uh, he knew he had to burn incense. Nobody told him that an angel was going to come and see him. You know, I don't think it had ever happened before during any other priest's time in the, in the, in the, in the sanctuary there. And there he is, and he stands there, and this angel comes to him and says, oh, your wife's going to have a baby. And he's saying, what? Um, it's a bit jaw-dropping when you get a sort of message like that, especially when, you, although you've been praying about it and everything else, you don't be, A, you don't expect to see an angel there, do you? And, and B, to get a message like that. And the angel turned and said, OK, don't believe me, right? You ain't going to speak for nine months. Not a word is going to come out of your mouth for nine months uh, until actually the, the event comes into being. And he goes home and uh, obviously sleeps with his wife. She becomes pregnant. Could they converse? I don't know. There's nothing in there that says they could. She could have been totally illiterate. He would have been literate because he was a priest. Uh, so how... They would have been able to get the message. He could have written in the sand or on something or other and sort of said, I saw an angel in there. And she would have said, oh, yeah. Now, can you imagine Mary when she's given this? There's Mary, a virgin, right? Uh, and the angel comes to her. And, and if you look at these two vastly different things, we've got Zechariah, who is in the temple, the most holy place in Jerusalem. 
we have Mary in a place called Nazareth. In John chapter 1, verse 46, when the disciples are being called, uh, we, I can read this, it says, The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, and finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What was Nathanael's response? Nazareth? <laughs> Can anything good come out of there? Yeah. You know, so, you know, Mary's not in the greatest place, is she? You know, uh, to have a visit from an angel. So we have these two totally contrasting visions, one in the temple and one in a place called uh, Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Na Joseph in the best told the story many years ago, four and a half years ago, um, I had to go in and have surgery. I went and saw my consultant and he said to me, well, Gordon, he said, it's either palliative care, um, don't know how long you'd have, uh, or you have an operation. Uh, it's a very complicated, long, serious operation. Go home and chat it over with your family. So I phoned my two boys and my youngest son turned around and said to me, he was... 50 odd then. Do you believe in prayers, Dad? Uh, sorry, do you believe in dreams, Dad? And I said, go on. Um, it's always a little bit. Uh, and he said to me, he said, but he said, I had a dream two days ago. Uh, he said, and I dreamt that there was me and you and Chris, who was my first wife who died six and a half years ago. So we're talking two years after that, and he said, it was now, he said, it wasn't in the past. And he said, mum turned around and said to me, he said, your dad's gonna have a, a, an operation, but he's gonna be okay. Um, and I think the only thing that Sue and I said, it sent goosebumps, you know. And we believed, I think. Do you know what I mean? I don't know whether you ever had that sort of said to you, that something like that. And it does, it sends goosebumps and you think, yeah, okay. Happy with that. Two days later I came down, I always do breakfast in the morning, and I came downstairs and I prepared it and then I call up and said to Sue, breakfast ready, and so she toddles downstairs and... Um, and she came into the kitchen. She said, what's the pebble on the, on the floor? I said, what are you talking about? So she said, there's a pebble on the floor over there. I said, I have no idea. And she bent down and picked it up. It was a pebble. It's about that size. And it's a pebble that had sat. We've got a very small shelf in our kitchen. And it just sits on that shelf. It had been there evidently for years, Sue's telling me. I never even knew it was there. So she picked it up, went to put it back on the shelf, and as she put it back on the shelf, she realised it had some writing on it which said, Once Upon a Dream. And we looked at each other and the goosebumps went even further. And we said, that's going to be all right then, isn't it? And two days later, we went to Sue's granddaughter's end-of-year school play. When we got there, it was Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat. And Sue said to me, well, I'm not worried about that then. You're going to be fine, aren't you? And when I was off in hospital, she was off doing other things, and people said, aren't you worried? She said, no, nope, not at all. Here I am. Um, for Mary, her confirmation, uh, she had to go on a little trip didn't she? She'd seen the, you know, what would you do if you'd been Mary and you'd had this vision? Would you go to mum and say, oh, mum, I'm pregnant. I haven't slept with anyone, but an angel came and visited me. Can you imagine, I don't know whether you've got daughters or anything, I, I haven't, thankfully. But, you know, can you imagine the daughter coming home and saying, I'm pregnant, I haven't slept with another man, but, you know. And they didn't have IVF in those days. Do you know what I mean? There was nothing like that going on. 
Um, but the angel had turned around and said to Mary, you know, your cousin, who is beyond childbearing age, is pregnant. She's six, three months pregnant. Um, or six months pregnant. So I said, wow. And so she makes her way up into the hill country of Judea. They're obviously living just outside of Jerusalem, you know, going into Jerusalem as a, as a priest would have been a special honour. Um, and she gets, she, she gets there. Now, who would Elizabeth have been able to speak to about her pregnancy? What we know is that from the story, Elizabeth didn't go out for five months once she realised she was pregnant. She didn't go out. She couldn't go out and turn around and say, I'm pregnant. Uh, because if you've ever had a baby, you don't start really showing until five, six months. Would that be about right? And that's why I believe that this bit here is so important when it says she didn't go out for five months because she, she didn't want to go out and tell everyone she was pregnant. And they say, well, you know, well, it doesn't show, does it? You know, are you really pregnant? Um, and she would have been found it very difficult. She didn't have a husband who could back her up verbally. And then Mary comes, knocks on the door, doesn't she? And what does it say here that Elizabeth's response is, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. How did she know she was bearing, bearing a child? This is all from the Lord, you know. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Is it, look at those words. Why she recognises that Mary is bearing a child who is special, really, really special. <clears throat> as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ear, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfil his promise. See, I believe that it was at that moment, it was an affirmation for both ladies. You know, for Elizabeth... You know, she actually realised that everything was working out for the good. And for Mary, yeah. And Mary and Elizabeth, I'm sure, spent long time chatting about what had happened. I'm sure that Mary even chatted with Zachariah. No record of that in Scripture. You know, because she'd had the vision. And she would have chatted to him and he wouldn't have been able to have spoken back. But maybe he could have written something some way that they could have communicated, I don't know. You know, Zachariah had been told, you will be silent and not able to speak until this day happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. Thankfully, that didn't happen to me. I mean, maybe Sue would have been pleased if I had been given, you know, Ability not to speak for a bit, but I. Um, but so far, you know, we're still here. Zachariah uh, had had six months of, of awkwardness of not being able to speak. That part of the message had come true, hadn't it? He knew that Elizabeth was pregnant. I'm sure that Elizabeth had said, Put your hand there, you know. I don't know when it starts kicking. I can remember about four months. I, said, I can remember when my grandson and his wife came round. Uh, she was expecting twins, my first great-grandchildren. Um, about 12 months ago. Well, just over 12 months ago now, wasn't it? And uh, so she sat down next to Sue, and Sue sort of said, here, feel here, feel here, you know. Absolutely nothing for several minutes. And then... Emily came and sat next to me. She said, put your hand there. Or I had cold hands. And I put my cold hand there and it went, whoo! <laughs> um, and you were quite jealous of that, really, weren't you? <laughs> um, but these things happen, don't you? Um, six months. Still had another three months to go. And we're told that actually Mary stayed with Elizabeth for a further three months. It's possible that Mary was there for the birth of 
John the Baptist. We're not told that she was, but if you sort of start adding scripture together. And of course, what you can say is if uh, Zachariah's call to the temple was at Yom Kippur, right? Yom Kippur is um, in, I can't remember now, I meant to look it up. It's April, May, I think, time. Uh, if she had been six months pregnant, no, it, no, Yom Kippur is in September, sorry, Yom Kippur is in September, uh, September, October. So in six months, it would have been March, April time. That time means that Jesus could have been born on the 25th of December. Now, don't take my word for that, right, because we've no idea what the day was. Uh, but it would sort of tie in that it was this time of year. I mean, the 25th of December is really chosen because uh, when Christianity came to this country, there was a, a Druid celebration that went on on that day, and the Christians came and took it over. But you see, I believe that God can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, and he might say, look, just so they do remember the day, it's going to be that day. But of course, it, we're, we're in the Western Church, if you go into the Eastern Church, they celebrate Christmas on the 7th of January. But so, you know, it may be in that, but it doesn't matter. It's immaterial. It's about remembering Christ's birth. And more importantly, what we did a little, a little bit earlier in remembering his death, remembering that he came uh, as a baby to be born, but also uh, as a man to die. So how do we go on about receiving these things? You know, verse 24 says his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. What would you have done if you'd been in these situations? What would you have done if you'd been uh, one of the disciples who hadn't been with Jesus on the Sunday of the resurrection. What about if you had been Thomas? Would you have believed? When the others turned around and said, here yeah, we had Jesus come. I'm sure that when Jesus came, we know that they were all shocked and amazed and that when he left, all the disciples, I'm sure, looked at each other and said, did that really happen? Did did we really have we didn't I didn't and they would have come to the end and then Thomas would have come back and they would have said Jesus was here yeah Paul the other one it's got bells on isn't it and then of course the following Sunday Jesus comes and he turns around and says to Thomas we're coming put you and where the nails went in put you Hand in my side, it is me, Thomas. And, and Thomas is the first of the disciples to turn around and say, my Lord and my God. First one who actually recognises him. So in the, East, in the Western Church here, we still call him Doubting Thomas. The Eastern Church call him Affirming Thomas. Yeah. And I like that. You know, we're all, we've all got doubts, haven't we? Is there anyone here who hasn't got any doubt? Oh, that's good. None of you. You all believe. What about Gideon? He was called. He didn't believe. He came from one of the smallest tribes. Why me, Lord? And then when he was sent out on a task, he said, Right, Lord, what I'm going to do, I'm going to lay a fleece out on the ground. Uh, I don't want there to be any Jew anywhere around apart from on the fleece. And when he gets up in the morning, where's the Jew? On the fleece. There's no more Jew anywhere else. So what did Gideon say? Thank you, Lord, I believe that. Nope. Next day he put the fleece out and he said, this time I want there to be Jew all the way round, but not on the fleece. Then he did believe. And it is difficult that sometimes we get a promise from God and we struggle to believe. Dear old Saul of Tarsus, there he is on this road to Damascus to prosecute the Christians. 
Jesus struck him blind. It was the only way he could get his attention. It was the only way for a few days, maybe three days, something like that, he was blind. Until another Christian comes along and prays for him. There are many stories in scripture about people who struggle to believe. You know, Mary, Zachariah. Mary's song, suddenly we realise that uh, she realised and believed that everything that the angel said was going back. I don't, we don't know when she even spoke to Joseph. We presume it was after she went back from seeing Elizabeth. Maybe she just turned around and said to Mum and Joseph, oh, I'm just going down to see Elizabeth for a few days. Is that all right? Not I'm pregnant, but she just needed to get away. She needed to get her head clear. She needed to find out really what was going on. And then by the time she came back, she was absolutely convinced and she could turn around and say to Joseph, everything that had happened. If you don't believe me, go and have a word with Zachariah and Elizabeth. And Joseph struggled with it, didn't he? Who wants to marry someone who's carrying somebody else's baby? What we know here in the, in the song, Mary's song, or the Magnificat, as some people call it, is that she really could praise God. And there's that lovely bit, sadly the Roman Catholics put Mary on a pinnacle. But here she even talks about my saviour. She knew that she needed the saviour. Although she was bearing that. That's why I sang that song. I mean, it's a, a very emotive song, isn't it? And there's another one called Joseph's Song. I'm not going to sing that today, but it talks about how Joseph holds this baby uh, and saying, you know, I, I want to be dad to this baby, which isn't mine, but it's the great I am. How am I... How am I supposed to look after a king? You know, I mean, if you had suddenly had a call from Kate and William a few years ago and will you look after our baby when it comes, we'll be bringing it to you, but you need to bring it up in the proper way in the house of Hanover? I don't know what house, but whatever, the royal household anyway, and you've got to bring it up. You'd be thinking, oh, wow. You know, that would be a real responsibility. Here, Mary is given something even more responsible, isn't she? King of kings. My soul glorifies the Lord, she said. Have you ever been called to do a special job for God? When I was called to be pastor of Copthorne Chapel 30 years ago. I thought, hmm, I don't know, it just didn't seem right to me. And then uh, Chris and I had a, were praying and God said to me, he said, don't worry about it, Gordon. He said, all your fears, do not worry about them to, at all. It's all going to be fine. And I said, don't tell me, tell her. And as I turned around, Chris looked at me and she said, we've got to say yes, haven't we? See, sometimes the Lord just says, trust me. Sometimes questions are quite big when we get that and we need affirmation. And I just pray that if you've got any doubts about Jesus being your Lord and Saviour, I pray that you can talk about it with other people and come to know the truth. We've got a very special God who can actually take, who takes away the sin of the world and can give you peace among all things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that at this time of year we come to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we come and thank you that this little baby that was born 2,000 years ago wasn't just any old baby. It was your son. It was your son who was, yes, come to be a baby, to 
to live and then to die. And Lord, we pray that you would enable us to recognise him in that way. Lord, sometimes we may struggle and yet Simeon recognised Jesus as the saviour of the world when Jesus was just 40 days old in the temple. Lord, we have his whole life accounted for and we're called to put our trust in him. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that over this Christmas period, if we have any doubts, that they can be put to one side. And Lord, that the ministry of this church can reach out to many other people and witness the love of the baby Jesus and of the man Jesus, of the crucified Jesus and of the resurrected Jesus. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 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 I'm going to close with the which I hope we're going to have up on there. The Virgin Mary had a baby boy. Is it one you know? I hope so. Mm notices um, for this week tomorrow is obviously messy church Christmas party I believe lots of party food um, Wednesday is open doors here 11 to 3 Cottingham's are back in control <laughs> and the, oh one of them is oh Jan's in control oh you're in oh you're away okay so Peter's in control oh nice oh that's right having a lovely trip to Austria um, prayer meeting 11.30 to 12.30 on Wednesday as well and then Thursday evening is the Christmas party at the Cottinghams. If you are still somebody that would like to come and hasn't got a lift arranged, 
speak to Dave or Pete or something at the end. I think we've got most people covered now. Should be all right. Um, and then next Sunday, it is the family service, family carol service yeah. in the morning with Pete. Um, tea and coffee served next door. Kirsty has b brought along her birthday cake. So do eat cake. <laughs> it was her birthday on Friday, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. But anyway, she's brought along her birthday cake to share, so do eat some of that, otherwise she's got a lot to take home. Um, anything else? Any other notices? Oh, Christmas Day. So <laughs> Christmas Day, we're doing lunch here after the morning service. I do need to know if you are coming, so final numbers would be fantastic. So if you are, I know that you guys are coming. So yeah, if you are coming or if you'd like to come, um, do let me know. Today, please, would be very, very helpful. Um, and that's it, I think.